Hey, Hope Church 130 service. You glad to be here today? Yeah. Good to see everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, let's give it up for the most dangerous worship band on the West Coast, Hope Rising. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we uh, put out the word that we wanted to do a semester of growth groups starting in September. And um, I think Megan announced that our goal was 10. And I remember thinking, really? That's a lot. We only had three right after the fire in the last semester. But eight people so far said they would lead a group. Isn't that awesome? Eight groups. We're so excited about that number uh, because that's eight opportunities of people to break down and, and look at each other in the faces and share heart to heart. So thank you for all of you that signed up. We'll have a training time uh, for them, and uh, we'll get ready to go next month. And also, we have a crew of people that are uh, working on Sunday morning. They come at 12, and they meet, and Gina uh, talks about the plan for the day, the script, and then um, uh, we do communion together, and then we break up, and there's ushers, and there's greeters, and there's hospitality, and there's people setting up chairs, and there's musicians and there's tech team and I'm so excited about that because when we go back up on the ridge that crew's already going to be doing what they're going to be doing when we get there and I want to thank everybody that's stepping up and serving and ministry to help our Sunday team. We don't know exactly how we're going to land yet up there. We're looking at opportunities. I have a meeting tomorrow morning with the planning commission. Just wanted to get some ideas of opportunities and I'll let you know when we know of course uh, but um, while we're here, we're not wasting our time, amen? Yeah. And uh, for the next few weeks, we're looking at uh, why are we here? And it's about purpose. It's some of the things that we share in our membership class, actually all of the class system, the spiritual life uh, seminars that we have. It's, uh, it's our philosophy of ministry and why we exist. Great, great thinkers throughout history have discussed the meaning and the purpose of life. A lot of times people don't really think about it. They just exist and try to have fun and work and try to fill in their time with some fun. But sooner or later, I think most people, sooner or later, some in college, some later, some after a difficulty, uh, people say, well, why am I here? What is the purpose of my life? Freud basically said it's to satisfy my urges. And uh, Nietzsche said to be a superman, uh, survival of the fittest, and overcome everybody else. He, by the way, died insane. Frankel, who was a survivor from Holocaust, even wrote a book about man's search for meaning. And uh, he, he said that he felt like the prisoners who didn't make it, a lot of them, they didn't have hope for the future. The ones who kept looking for a better future uh, lasted longer and survived. And he talked about life. He wrote in his book about finding purposeful work, uh, love, and courage in the face of difficulty. That difficulty shapes us and it's part of who we are and our purpose for existence. What is the reason for us living on this ball of clay? Is it to get stuff? You know, get all I can, can all I get, sit on the can? You know, is, it, is that what life is all about? Um, and then you look at advertising, and they really go for, uh, for communicating uh, and, and what they're about, but also sometimes they use selfishness um, to um, attract people to buy their product. And I'm going to do a little um, test here just to show the power of advertising. This will probably work best for 35 or older. Uh, so. I want to ask you, what does McDonald's put on their Big Macs? Two all beef patties, special sauce, pickles, onions, and a sesame seed bun. The power of advertising is powerful. Uh, we all know that things go better with Coke, and Gillette is the best is the best a man can get, and Domino's delivers. And so they, they use your self, um, selfism, meism, I need my minitis, I call it, a disease we have, uh, to attract you to, to spend your money. You deserve a break today, so get out and get away. Have it your way. And even some that uh, in, in our generation uh, focus 
not only about uh, getting what they have, but hurrying about it. Just do it. Why wait? Obey your thirst. No boundaries. Got the urge? In other words, be selfish, instantly gratify yourself, regardless of the consequences. And remember, he who dies with the most toys wins. I had this article uh, called The Secret of Happiness in Helping Others. And I couldn't help but notice that even though it's talking about helping others, and there's good points in it, keeps referring to self in the process. Um, and, and it starts off, there is a Chinese saying that goes, if you want to be happy, if you want happiness for an hour, take a nap. If you want happiness for a day, go fishing. There's Donald's. If you want happiness for a year, inherit a fortune. If you want happiness for a lifetime, help somebody. For centuries, the greatest thinkers have suggested the same thing. Happiness is found in helping others. St. Francis of Assisi said, for it is in giving that we receive. Tolstoy, famous author, said the sole meaning of life is to serve humanity. Winston Churchill said, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. Nobel Prize recipient Muhammad Yunus said, making money is happiness. Making other people happy is super happiness. I like that. And then I'm going to see if you know who said this. Giving back is as good for you as it is for those you are helping because give, giving gives you purpose. When you have a purpose-driven life, you're a happier person. I think it's Rick Warren? Actually, it's Goldie Hawn said that. I love that. Goldie Hawn said that. Um, the, the resounding answer is, yes, uh, the secret to happiness is giving. Scientific research provides compelling data to support the anecdotal evidence that giving is a powerful pathway to personal growth and lasting happiness. Through fMRI technology, we now know that give, giving activates the same parts of the brain that are stimulated by food and sex. Ex experiments show evidence that altruism is hardwired in the brain and it's pleasurable. Helping others may just be the secret to living a life that is not only happier, but also healthier, wealthier, more productive, and meaningful. So that's what I mean about it, it's true, but it's saying your motive is self to give to others. And it says, find your passion, and you got to find what's right for you. Give your time. That's the most important thing, I think, that we can give, and we all have the same amount. We don't all have the same amount of money. We all have the same amount of time. Uh, give to organizations with transparent aims and roles so you know what you're supporting. Find ways to integrate your interests and skills with the needs of others. So it, it talks about it's better to give and to be otherish, but still keep your own interests in sight. They can't stop mentioning self, even though they're talking about giving. Be proactive, not reactive, uh, and don't be guilt tripped that God talks about that. Give cheerfully. So even when we talk about giving, I think there are benefits, obviously, but we don't give just for ourselves. Jesus stands the opposite on a lot of these thinkers. And he says, it's not about you. When you first come to Jesus, and if you come because you have needs, that's okay because he met needs all the time uh, because people are hungry and they're open and they're receptive. But he never left people self-focused, I'm here to help you with your needs. He pointed them to a lost world. And, and so he teaches us, after we start following, it's not about you. So what is the most important thing, according to Jesus? Let's look at this quote. This is the great commandment. Jesus is asked by this guy who's trying to trap him, what's the greatest commandment? Now, in the Torah, in the law and prophets, there's over 600 commands. Imagine that you're asked, out of six, over 600 commands, what's the most important? They think they got it. And his answer is brilliant. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Let's all read that out loud together. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, 
Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. Are you guys reading it over here? Or was I in your way? you got to memorize it, you know. That's kidding. Sorry about that. So Jesus says the most important thing is loving God and loving people. We are the only organization that exists for those not in it yet. All other commands also don't matter if we don't love. He says all the law and all the prophets hang on these things. Jesus is saying if you're not going to love God and love people, don't bother. They all hang on that foundation. And, um, and, and you, are, you are beautifully and you are wonderfully made, Scripture says. I don't think you should hate yourself. And that's not what he's talking about. Even those who are down on themselves and cutting themselves, Jesus would say you're preoccupied with self. It's not about you. It's not about me. And, and he says it's about loving God and loving people. And then we have what is called the Great Commission. Let's go to that one. Let's read this out loud together. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. We used to have a member named Shirley. I used to tease her about this verse. Hey, God is with you, Shirley. But uh, uh, first of all, this is what's the, called the Great Commission. Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So see, you have the authority to do the Great Commission. You don't have to wait for Stan to say it's okay or the pastoral board or any of our staff. We all have been given the authority to go and make disciples. We have this little girl we babysitted for a while named Stephanie, and she's a little thing. We were in San Francisco, and uh, one day before her parents, they're Christians, come home from work, I said, Stephanie, today you're going to learn the Great Commission. So all day long I was memorizing this with her, go make disciples. So her mom and dad come in, and uh, I go, Stephanie, tell your parents what the Great Commission is. And she said, go make some apples. <laughs> disciples. Disciples are people who are following Jesus, trying to become Jesus. And we baptize them, and then they're done, right? No, that's like having a baby and taking them to the nursery and say, there's your diapers and your food, take care of yourself, see it. You, know, you just begun. It's a growth process. Then he says, teaching them, so we're learners. Disciples all our life, we're learners. Everything I've commanded you. Now we are the only organization that exists for those not in it. Again, I want to say that, forever. We're, we're trying to reach people to be in it forever. We are a scent people. I don't mean we smell, although we are a scent people that way, and the ladies smell better than the guys. But uh, I mean, you don't judge a church by its seating capacity, but by its sending capacity. What happens when they leave the doors? So they go out in the world to go and make disciples. You can't say God without go. You can't say gospel without go. That's what we're about as disciples. Now, I had a teacher once, a mentor, who was a, a Greek scholar, and he said, you could really read this like, having gone, disciple the nations. And his point was, it's a natural thing for disciples. If you're really focused on following Jesus, discipling those who come in contact with you is just what you do. It's in you. You share about your Lord. We all share in different ways. Where's Debbie at? Debbie's in the back row. Everybody say hi, Debbie. Hi, Debbie. Debbie is one of the reasons that we came to Chico because Debbie was baptized here. And she said she promised me she's going up the ridge when we move back. But uh, Debbie, new believer, uh, came uh, with her friend Donnie, and then she became a believer and was baptized. And then and she's going to Gina's group, excited about that group starting again in Donald's group. And um, she said recently she was started playing Christian music at work, and the, a guy told her that 
you got us. My wife and I have gone back to church. You know, isn't that awesome? We all do it in different ways, but it's natural. Having gone, disciple the nation. It's natural to share. And there's over a billion people in the world that claim to believe in the truths about Jesus Christ. His mission is still going, and, and there's so many that have gone to be with him. And so we're all a part of this mission. Now, the King James says, Lo, I am with you always. Instead of surely, it's lo, I am with you always. And I like to say, there's no low if we don't go. This is a promise. It's not the great option. It's not the great omission. It's the great commission. And Jesus promises, I am with you always. And I love that because there's a lot of things I'm not sure if God cares about. But if I know I'm trying to share Jesus with people, Jesus promises he's with me. Even if it doesn't go like I'd hoped and I get disappointed in this or that, I can lay my head down at night and go, Jesus is with me. It's an awesome promise that uh, Jesus is with us as we. And he says, ta ethnos in the Greek, that, that word nations, all nations. All, that's where we get our word ethnic, all ethnic groups. The purpose of every person, they don't all know it, but the purpose of every person is to become a disciple of Jesus. And so here's something that we're, we're going to memorize. This is a quote uh, we, we're going to share. I'm going to put it in our my one-on-one class material burned up, so I've been thinking a lot about how I want to put it together. It'll be like uh, what many of you went through already, but I want to make sure we emphasize this. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. I like simple things, simple recipes. This is simple. And if we focus on those two things, we get a good result. Let's say that out loud together. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great church. When you look at the life of Jesus, he practiced these two things over and over. He went around pointing people to God, praying to the Father, depending on God, and he went around touching lepers, who everybody else wanted to stay out in a garbage dump outside of town, and yell, unclean, unclean, if anybody came close. And Jesus not only healed them, he reached out and he touched them. See, I would have healed them, but I might have said, stand back. <laughs> Jesus reaches out and touches this person with rotting skin. And his disciples go, oh, that's what God is like. And when they, they were ready to stone a woman caught in the act of adultery, interesting that they just brought the woman. Last time I heard, it takes two. But anyway, uh, they're ready to stone her to death. And Jesus shows her mercy. You go, that's what God is like. And to a tax collector, a businessman, they were known for skimming off the top and they were called sinners. And, and Jesus is criticized for hanging out and reaching out. And Jesus says, I came to seek and save the lost. Jesus focused on the great uh, commandment and the great commission his entire life. And he loved so much until they killed him. Now, Here's another quote that we want to memorize. A great com the great commandment and the great commission. No, I already said that. Let's go to the next one. I'm sorry. A great commitment to the great commandment and the great commission will grow a great Christian. Not just a great church. A great individual disciple. Christian means Christ one. We belong to Christ. We wear his name. They, they uh, hated Jesus. And they called him, you know, they hated the Christ and they killed him. And then they had a whole bunch of little Jesuses running around and they called them Christ ones, Christians. Some say our name came as a cut down or put down. But Peter writes, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. But in that name, let him glorify God. If you want to be a great Christian, according to the scripture, and according to Jesus, focus on the great commandment, loving God and loving people and the great commission, going and making disciples. Now there's power in mottos, the power of mottos, um, sometimes called taglines, uh, sometimes called mantras. There's a guy named Guy Kawasaki, who it sounds like a motorcycle guy, but he actually was a Silicon Valley guy, and he wrote a great book, and he, he talks about the power of a mantra, your driving force, why you exist. And you can see mantras, purposes, purpose statements, mission statements, 
uh, vision, core values in company statements. There's whole departments in places like Harvard where they study the culture of organizations and they've learned that you have to line up why you say you belong with what you do or it doesn't make sense. It's not congruent. But when you do what you say is the reason you exist and you sum it up, there's power in that. Think about the power of taglines. FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. itself. He said that a long time ago. Look at how many people know that. JFK, ask not what your country can do for you, what you can do for your country. Martin Luther King, I have a dream. dream. Powerful speech about preferred vision that showed equality. Uh, Richard Nixon, I'm not a crook. Bill Clinton, I did not inhale. <laughs> Taglines, um, there's power in mottos. Now what's Hope's mottos or statements? Well, one of them that we have is building relationships that last forever. Is the great commandment in that? Yeah, relationships. Mm-hmm. Love God, love people is relationships. Jesus says that's more important than all the other commands. And then this word right here, Great commission. Go make disciples of all nations forever. We're not just making friends uh, for now and in our life. We're making friends that last forever. When I moved here, I'm a change agent. I like to change stuff and, you know, it's fun to dream. And when I saw that statement, I was looking for a relationship oriented place in a community that's in their relationships. I went into Safeway at, at uh, Paradise, and the guy goes, so what'd you do today? And I almost fell over after being in the Bay Area. Nobody ever asked you, what'd you do today, you know? And uh, I got this call before I came here. I'd sent in some material on who I was and what I wanted to do, and this guy named Forrest Orndorff called me, and uh, he said, I'm not calling you to uh, interview you. I'm calling you to ask you to consider becoming part of our family. I said, wow, because I wanted relationship. So when I read this statement that the original Hope Pastor Roth put down, I believe, I said, I'm not changing that. I also said the same about Hope. I don't want to change Hope. You know, Larry Shelton took me out to lunch from CMA when he was a senior pastor. He said, I kind of hoped the church wasn't going to make it so we could steal your name. (laughs) It's a beautiful name. Oh, he was teasing. So uh, that is Great Commission. And great commandment. Love God, love people. There's the great commandment. And also, I believe the great commission, because we don't really love people if we don't share Jesus with them. So I brought that one. That was on my resume, and it's my life mission because of the great commandment, the great commission. In Christ, we have, always have hope. That's a statement about our name, but it's this word always. It's like the word forever. Go make disciples of Jesus, Christ. Loving God, God. So God is in it. It's, I like it because it reminds us we always have hope. Even after a wildfire, the greatest one in the history of our state, we still always have hope. Amen? Amen. And then this is, about, this is about our strategy. How big do we want to get? Just one more. Just one more. I'm, I'm too old now to be worried about the numbers game. You know, a big church or a little church. I've had both. I just want to reach just one more. Just one more. They asked uh, Rockefeller, who a wealthy guy, uh, how much money do you want to have or make? And he said, just a little bit more. <laughs> how many people do I want to reach? Just one more. Just one more. So you see purpose in this, a reason for existence. You see how we do it. You, you, can't, you can't build relationships that last forever if you don't love. And people need love. Everybody's looking for love and to find love and acceptance. They don't want just a head full of knowledge and to to go to school and take tests and get education. That's scary, right? But some Christians have the idea it's all about learning more stuff and that's it. No, it's about applying what we learn and it's about love, loving God and loving people. Now in Christ, we always have hope. It's our spirit. It's our spirit, man. I love when we say that every week and we go, I thought of that after this fire, you know. In Christ, we always have hope. And just one more is our strategy. We're focused on reaching people that don't know the Lord. So I want to show you a verse, Mark 8, 34 through 36. And it says, Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, 
and said, whoever, everybody say whoever. He doesn't say pastors, elders, deacons, super Joe Christian. Whoever wants to be my disciple, my follower, wear my name, walk with me, must deny themselves and take up their cross and do whatever they want to do. Oh, hey, no, follow me, Jesus. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses this life for me and for the gospel will save it. See, he, Jesus is the opposite of it's about you, it's about you, it's about you. I don't believe in self-esteem. I believe in Christ's esteem. Uh, I, I think we should find our esteem in Christ. And we're God's sons and daughters. And Jesus is our big brother. And that's our identity. Instead of holding on myself, 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 it's him and who he is and, and his cause. And then he says, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? You know what that last part says to me? That last part to me says that one soul is worth more than all the world. That's why I'm glad we came here, Debbie. One soul is worth more than all the world. Your soul, my soul, is worth more than all the world. And Satan is like having this big uh, display room, and he sneaks in, and he switches all the price tags, and he puts the cheap tags uh, on the expensive stuff, and he puts the high price on stuff not as important. Things like family and relationships not as important. It's all about money. It's all about work. It's all about fame. It's all about stuff. And Jesus turns it upside down. Now, denying yourself is like talking about when you first become a Christian and then you're done, right? When he says take up a cross, what's he talking about? Jewelry? Get a pretty necklace? When the disciples are standing there, and they hear him say, take up a cross. They're thinking of a funeral procession, and it's your own. Now, do you just have to do that when you get baptized to deny yourself? It's daily. And sometimes I get it mixed up, and I take Stan off the cross, and I want to do what Stan wants and follow what I want. And then I go, oh, yeah, Jesus wants me to get back on that cross. I'm being selfish. It's a daily struggle all our lives, and we have this struggle with our bodies, with our flesh, and with the spirit. And your soul is worth it. Mark 10, 29 through 31. Look at this one. This is some of the benefits. Truly, I tell you, Jesus replied, no one who has left home, or brothers, or sisters, or mother, or father, or children, or fields, for me and the gospel, will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age, homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and friends, along with persecutions, Jesus tells it like it is, and in the age to come, eternal life, but many who are first will be last, and the last first. So you've got to look at the context of this discussion in Mark 10. And this guy pulls up in a nice uh, chariot. He gets out and he's got some really nice Gucci sandals on or something and uh, briefcase and he's got his act all together. And he comes up and he says, hey, good teacher, uh, what must I do to inherit life, eternal life? And, and Jesus says, why are you calling me good? Only God is good, which is a little hint on who he is. And then he, he says, you know the commandments, don't murder or commit adultery or give false testimony or, or defraud and honor your father and your mother. And he says, teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And I love the next verse. It says, Jesus looked at him and loved him. I find that interesting. And then he says, one thing you lack, Jesus knows his heart. He says, go sell everything you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this, the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. Now, is that what Jesus wants all of us to do? Sell everything we own, give it to the poor, and then we're saved? If, we, if that's the truth, then 
you're lost because you got stuff, then you give it to the poor, and now they're saved. And you're, now they're lost, and now you're saved, right? And then they got to find someone else to give it to so they can be saved, and then you get my point, right? But he knows the guy's got a problem with stuff. I believe all of us have to give it up in our hearts that God comes before our stuff in every relationship. Uh, and, and, and so Jesus says after this, looking around at his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. I remember being a kid thinking, camel going through the eye of a needle? <laughs> and this gets even more scary when you realize in America, we're richer than most people in the whole world. They're trying to figure out what they're going to eat tonight, you know, and uh, for one meal on the day or where to put their head to rest. So the disciples were amazed. They're like, who then can be saved? And Jesus looked at them and said, with man it's impossible, but nothing is impossible with God. So he knew this guy's heart. And this led to this discussion that we're, we're, we have here on the board. And uh, Peter spoke up and he said, we have left everything to follow you. I sometimes wonder if Peter's like realizing, you know, hey, we, I hope this thing works out. We've left everything, you know. <laughs> but I, I think he's proclaiming because Jesus is talking about wealth and the pool and how hard it is and he says we've left everything and then Jesus makes this statement of the benefits that we get when we leave it all for his sake and for the gospel and he, see, he says we receive a hundred times in this present age homes, brothers, sisters, mothers children, fields I'm thinking what does that mean when I left to go to preacher school with my young family, my mom stood out by her house. A lot of my friends or some of our, our loved ones were thought we were crazy to move away thousands of miles to go into the ministry. Are you kidding? What's he smoking now? And uh, not my mom. She's like, go get him. Waving us off to go into the ministry and never complained about wherever we live uh, because of her faith like this. But I still wasn't sure what all this meant until now I know. Now that I've worked four years uh, in different cities and towns, I have brothers and sisters everywhere. I have mothers and fathers in the gospel. I have houses. Wherever there's a brother, I could show up at your house or trailer and say, <laughs> say I'm home and you have to let me in. Because we're forever family. That's what he's talking about. If you think I, I'm lying or he's lying, I challenge you to try it. I've found it true. I've got friends that would, I think would give their life for me. They're so good to me uh, because of Jesus that I wouldn't have ever had if I didn't come and go and follow him. So there's benefits, uh, so many benefits. It's not a bad thing to deny ourselves when we follow Jesus. So... <clears throat> the purpose of my life in Christ is greater than myself, and it never stops until I see him face to face. That purpose that we have never ends all our life, and then we go to see him face to face. What an organization we're a part of in the church, the kingdom of God. Apple's motto, think different. L'Oreal, because you're worth it. Bounty, the quicker picker upper. Dunkin' Donuts, America runs on Dunkin'. McDonald's, I'm loving it. Verizon, can you hear me now? Good. State Farm, like a good neighbor? State Farm is there. USMC, the few, the proud, the Marines. KFC, it's finger licking good. Disneyland, the happiest place on earth. There's some good purposes in organizations on this planet, but there's a lot of things that people are pouring their life out for that won't matter 100 years from now or even 50 years from now. But what we're a part of in Christ will matter forever and ever when we love God and we love people and we help people know Jesus. We're building relationships that will last forever and ever. Our friends 
from hope that are gone on to be with the Lord. We're going to see him again. We're going to be with him again. We're friends forever. So I love this imaginary story. I, I kind of love it. It's convicting. Jesus goes back to heaven and an angel says, well, my Lord, how did it go down there on earth? And Jesus says, well, I chose some disciples. I said, I want you to, I trained them. And I said, go make disciples of all nations. And the angel says, well, Lord, what if that plan doesn't work? And Jesus says, I have no other plan. It's our plan, brothers and sisters. It's our mission. One day, I believe we'll be in heaven. And someone's going to come up to you and say, thank you. And you're going to go, seriously? What are you thinking of me? I'm just glad I'm here. They're going to say, you're a part of Hope Church. And I was invited to Hope Church. And because of your love and your fellowship, I became a part of Jesus Christ's body. Thank you. I'm here for all eternity because of you. And so, after spending our lives following Jesus, trying to be like Jesus, carrying out the mission of Jesus, one day we see him face to face. And what I want to hear, only one thing. It's the thing I've tried to stay focused on my entire ministry. After I found out I could actually be saved and live forever in the kingdom and work for God. And then, to me, it didn't make sense to just try to uphold tradition or comfortable Christians. What a contradiction, you know. Um, uh, you're in my queue. I'm sorry. You're in my parking place. You know what I do when I drive in and Grace's parking lot is packed at 12? Every Sunday I go, amen, amen, amen. They're packed. They're growing. They're reaching their city. It's selfish Christians that are a contradiction. Well, I have my preference. I don't know if I like that song. I'm a little judge here, like a dive coach that holds up a number. That was a seven. I don't want to think about, will it help me reach just one more? Will it help me build relationships? Will it last forever? It's about what I like. We've got to make the main thing the main thing. And I pray when I'm dead and gone that somebody stands here with fire in their belly and makes the main thing the main thing. Seek and save the lost. I don't know, mentor from Arkansas, S. Leo Richardson. He went to get a loan for a church building, and the banker said, what is the purpose of this institution? He said, well, I told him, the salvation of souls. And the banker said, I like that. There's no greater purpose. Baptisms, transformation of lives, people who've been kicked around, never been hugged, or just slugged, Finding love and acceptance and then becoming a part of that mission, a key player in that mission. I'm obsessed with that. To it, for it, with it. I'm obsessed. I'm addicted to it. I love it more than anything else. Playing church, fighting over a building, who moved my cheese, criticizing, puke! But one more saved, one more brought into the kingdom. That is awesome. And I pray that my heart never stops beating to that purpose and that meaning and that focus. Because frankly, who wants to waste time turning inward and having spiritual navel gazing? Amen? Amen? We have a mission, the greatest mission. It's a mission of beauty. It's a mission of otherness. It's a mission of outreach. And that's why we exist. Doesn't matter to me how big we get, how small we got, I still got job security. There's people all around who don't know Jesus. I got job security. I may have to beg for support, which I've done and I'll do, but I got job security wherever there are souls. Just one more. Just one more. Well, I could preach on this all day. I better hush. <clears throat> Let's pray again. Thank you, Father. The world thinks it's all about stuff. It's all about getting stuff. And we're we separate and we segregate and we fight and we war. And then you come and show us it's not about us. It's not about me. And you point us to a lost world. Your mission is higher. I don't care how much money a person has, how famous they are, where they work, how much stuff they have. That's all going to burn in the big bonfire. But your mission people who become believers in your family are going to last forever and ever and ever. And I don't care if people think we're old-fashioned or they make fun of us. It comes with the territory. Lord, I pray we will stay focused on a mission that's greater than ourselves. 
and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.